Uh, next speaker is uh, Meredith McGregor uh, from Carnegie uh, Institute, and she will be discussing detection of millimeter uh, flare from Proxima Centauri. You have your device? You want yeah. to understand? This is the forward. That's the forward, and this is the Yeah, the button here. Okay. Um, it. So many things to hold. All right. Thank okay. You. Great, everybody can hear me, I think. So um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first Cool Stars meeting. Um, and today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about some work I've done detecting the first millimeter flare from Proxima Centauri. So I'm sure that pretty much everybody in this room are experts on the Proxima Centauri system, but we'll do a quick overview of the system architecture just so we're all on the same page. So Proxima Centauri is a spectral type M5.5 at 1.3 parsecs. It has a detected radio velocity planet in the habitable zone. So that has an MP sine I of 1.3 Earth masses and a semi-major axis of 0 0.05 AU. And at the end of last year, there was a paper that came out claiming a system of three dust belts. So these are three debris disks, one a warm disk at 0.4 AU, a cold belt from 1 to 4 AU, and an outer belt at 30 AU. Now this would be really exciting because this would make Proxima Centauri somewhat like our own solar system, which has a star, planets, and multiple debris disks, the asteroid, and Kuiper belt. So these disks were done um, from ALMA observations. And this is kind of the brief overview of these ALMA observations. I'm going to dig a little bit more in in a second. But the system was actually observed 15 times with ALMA, twice with what we call the full 12-meter array. Um, these were both taken on April 25th of 2017, and then 13 times with the ACA. Um, spanning between January and March of last year. So what I'm presenting today is these exact same ALMA observations. This is just a new analysis of them, so no new ALMA data has been taken on Proxima so far. Maybe this will click. Uh, okay. So um, for those who are not ALMA super users yet, um, the ALMA array consists of two arrays, really. So we have the full array, what's called the main array. This consists of 50 12-meter dishes. And then there's a second array that's smaller called the Atacama Compact Array, or ACA. And this is 12 slightly smaller 7-meter antennas. You can use either one of these individually. Um, so all of the observations that I'm going to show you today were taken at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters in frequency that's 230 gigahertz, and it's called ALMA Band 6. Um, and ALMA actually doesn't observe at a single frequency, it observes at a range of frequency, what we call a bandwidth, which is actually 8 gigahertz, so you can kind of get a spectral uh, index or a spectrum while you're doing your ALMA observations, and you get two linear polarizations, the XX and YY. Uh, ALMA Linguo, a single ALMA observation is called a scheduling block, um, often abbreviated to SB, so each ALMA observation is about an hour and a half in length, and then during that hour and a half, you're basically alternating between your source, which you observe in this case for about six minutes, and a phase calibrator that's meant to take out your atmospheric correlations. So you go source for six and a half minutes, calibrator for a minute and a half, and then back and forth. Okay. Whoop. This thing is not very great. I'm gonna go back this way, skipping that. Okay. So the start by looking at the ALMA 12-meter observations. So what I'm showing here are three images. On the far left is all of the ALMA data from the 12-meter array, these two observations averaged together into a single image, and then each of the observations separately. You can see in all of these observations, you detect this nice unresolved point source at the center of the image. It has a flux that's fairly consistent, somewhere between 94 and 110 microjanskis. For reference, the expected photospheric flux of Proxima Centauri is 74 plus or minus 4 microjanskis. That's estimated simply by taking the stellar spectral energy distribution and extrapolating it from short wavelengths all the way out to the millimeter. So we can then take those observations, which I said are these hour and a half scheduling blocks, and actually split them up into the individual now integrations. So these are looking at these six minute integration chunks in blue for the first observation and in red for the second. And again, the flux is fairly consistent. The full range of flux measurements is 50 to 157 microjanskis. You'll note that this is slightly above the photospheric flux by about 30 microjanskis on average. Now with that eight gigahertz of spectral 
window, we can actually calculate a spectral index. So the flux is a function of frequency for the star. That comes out to be about two and a half, which is very consistent with the Rayleigh genes emission like we'd expect for a stellar photosphere at millimeter wavelengths. And we can take those two xx and yy polarizations and calculate a lower limit on the fractional linear polarization, which comes out to be basically zero. So the initial paper interpreted this slight 30 microjansky excess as evidence for dust where this excess emission is coming from dust around the star getting heated and then re-radiating thermal emission. But I'd like to draw a comparison here to another m dwarf star, AUMIC. Now this is an earlier M-type star, M1, um, but AUMIC has been studied intensively at millimeter and radio observations because it has a beautiful debris disk, one of only a few M-type stars known to have a debris disk. So I actually looked at AUMIC previously with both the VLA in the top here and ALMA, and the, uh, the star itself is just going crazy, basically, at all radio wavelengths. Um, so these are spaced by about a day, and then a month later for the third, and the star is varying within minute to hour long time scales, day, month long time scales, and flaring. And in the ALMA image, we detect the beautiful disk, but also this bright point source, which is about six times brighter than we'd expect the photosphere to be, which initially led us to think maybe asteroid belt emission, but actually you can create a model of coronal heating of continual small flares that can actually explain all the emission we see at X-ray through radio and millimeter wavelengths. So there's no need to invoke dust emission in either case. Now looking at the ACA observations, this is again all of the data together. Now the first 12 observations average together and then the last one all by itself. In the first 12, we don't detect anything above two sigma at all. And in the third, it's the 13th, it's booming bright. And if we split that up even further, now we can look at not only those individual integrations, but basically the dump time of the telescope. So these are two second points. And we can see that during that last observation, the star underwent a significant flaring event. We have quiescent emission where we don't detect anything, a series of small pre-flares, and this very massive flare. Taking a closer look at the properties of that flare, at peak, the flare is a thousand times brighter than it is during quiescence, so the peak flux is 100 plus or minus 4 millijanskys. That gives us a luminosity of 2 times 10 to the 14 ergs per second per hertz. We see a sp falling spectral index, so this is the flux density, spectral index, and linear polarization. As you go into the flare, the spectral index becomes negative with a peak value of minus 1.77 and then returns to uh, Rayleigh Jean's consistent level at 2. And the polarization actually becomes negative before flipping positive with a peak value of 0.19. Now, how does this compare to other millimeter flares? There's very few data points, actually. We have observed some millimeter flares from the sun. Um, those of luminosity is about 2 times 10 to the 13. So this Proxima flare is 10 times brighter than the brightest solar millimeter flares. And they have very different spectral indices, somewhere between 0.3 and 5 positive, so not negative like we see from Proxima. OK, so what does this mean for dust in the system? Essentially, we can rule out that there is any dust within 4AU of the star. Um, I'd like to underline the point here that this requires you know, caution when interpreting excess from unresolved sources as dust belts. We really need to better understand the millimeter and radio emission from these stars in order to actually characterize what might be coming from excess dust. If we don't understand the star, you can't really interpret that there is a dust belt. Of course, the outer dust belt still remains. The current observations cannot actually prove or rule out the presence of an outer dust belt. They're just not good enough observations. But I will note some caveats here. This is now the ACA image again, but I've drawn this blue dashed line to indicate where the proposed outer dust belt is at 30 AU. So the dust belt is inferred by taking these five about three sigma peaks and radially averaging them, which gives you a dust belt that's one and a half to two millijanskys in total flux. But there are some significant caveats when doing this. Um, ALMA is well known to have many background galaxies in its fields. Uh, and there's been a number of papers, including this Carniani work from 2015, actually doing source counts for ALMA. And you can calculate how many background galaxies you would expect to see in your ALMA field of view. And if you do that for this, you know, about a minute by arc minute by arc minute square field, you predict that there should be 13 with some large error bars plus 10 minus 8 background sources in the image. So that's quite a whopping number of potential background galaxies. And in addition, Proxima Centauri is near the galactic plane, and it's in a region of known high background series. In fact, it confused some previous Spitzer observations taken at 60 microns back in 2007, which were looking for dust emission from the system. 
So, okay. So what we'd really like to know now that we have detected a millimeter flare from an MDORF is what this can tell us about the emission mechanisms for flares at these wavelengths from stars. Of course, that's very hard to figure out if we have exactly one event. Lucky for us, as of a couple days ago, we now have two, so we have doubled our sample size, which is very exciting. So this is some work that my summer student, Samantha O'Sullivan, who's going to be a Harvard undergrad in the fall, has been doing for me. And we have detected another flare in the millimeter, again at 1.3 millimeters from OMA, around AUMIC now. So this is the flux density as a function of time. Uh, this flare is, in fact, 10 times brighter than the Proxima flare. So the flux is only about 17 millijanskis, but that means the luminosity of about 2 times 10 to the 15 ergs per second per hertz at the distance of AUMIC. And again, we see a falling spectral index at peak. The spectral index is minus 1.3 plus or minus 0 0.07. Okay, so I think I should be just about out of time, so I wanted to end with some takeaways from my talk. Um, we've detected a stellar flare at millimeter wavelengths for the first time from Proxima Centauri with ALMA, and now we have another one from AU-MIC. There is no indication of dust emission in the system within 4AU. This really opens a new observational window with ALMA and other submillimeter telescopes to really dig into the mechanisms responsible for stellar flaring. There needs to be caution when interpreting unresolved excess emission as dust. Uh, and then finally, we really need additional observations at millimeter and complementary wavelengths. Rachel talked about doing multi-wavelength observations of flaring um, to learn more about these systems. So uh, exciting news, which will maybe be ready for the next Cool Stars meeting. Um, I just had an ALMA proposal accepted last week to do extensive monitoring of Proxima Centauri. So we have about 40 hours of observations. And so far, this is going to be done simultaneously with a number of optical observations as well. So the every scope, several small Carnegie telescopes, and most. Uh, so looking forward to new multi-wavelength observations now, including ALMA of stellar flaring. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, we're open to questions. Right here and then here. One, two, three. Yuta Notz from Kyoto University. Thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, you show uh, uh, spectral index values, and uh, what can we learn from a spectral index of this uh, Proxima flare? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. And so these were the slides that I didn't have a chance to actually do in 11 minutes. Um, so one possibility for the kind of anomalously negative spectral index that we see from now these two flares is that we could be tracing an optically thin part of the synchrotron spectrum. So we think at longer radio wavelengths we're usually tracing optically thick emission. But if we were in the optically thin part of the spectrum, this would be exciting because we could actually use this to tell us something about the parallel index of the non-thermal electrons. So there's this uh, Dolk et al. 1985 paper, which gives you a relation basically between the spectral index that we see and kind of the hardness of the uh, electron radiation. So that would be exciting if that was true, um, and we could actually learn quite a bit more about flares from that. So. Gabor Basri, UC Berkeley. Um, Actually, I see Jeff's hand just going up. He might be wanting to ask the same question I'm going to ask, which is the, the millimeter continuum um, doesn't come from the same place as the, as the photospheric effective temperature. So when people compute those, are they taking that into account? You just, I mm -hmm. figure you are, but you didn't mention it. Uh, so what, in terms of predicting what the photospheric flux should be? Yeah. Uh, my impression is no. Generally, what is done in the millimeter community is not correct, as you have pointed out, which is to simply assume that this is all the same photosphere and take whatever you see at much shorter wavelengths and just extrapolate it as a straight Rayleigh Jeans tail all the way out. Um, but so you, that's, you did? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I did not. Um, I was not trying to isolate. I mean, the, that's usually done when trying to claim dust emission around these stars. So there's a lot of interest in detecting hot asteroid belts because we have not really resolved a warm dust belt, and so they're detected as excesses in which you assume that you know the photosphere right. is the same <laughs> and you just take whatever excess straight up at face value. 
and that's clearly not correct. I have seen for sun-like stars, so for Epsilon Airy and Tau Ceti, we've looked at with Alma and the VLA, and Jackie Villison has done this as well, uh, and you can actually see that they are significantly brighter at millimeter, and so you actually see um, this kind of uptick in the brightness temperature, and you can trace that out. It's also been done for Alpha Sen A and B from Lazo et al. Okay. Yeah, it's from I think, I think we have time for just one question. Let's get the, the young gentleman here. Younger gentleman than uh, Ward Howard, UNC Chapel Hill. Wonderful talk. Um, so what about the prospects for the outer dust belt um, now that you're going to have some proper motion distance with the new observations? Um, yes. So you will benefit from the proper motion. Proxima Centauri clearly has high proper motion. Um, I think what you actually win at is the fact that by doing 40 hours of continuous monitoring looking for stellar variations, you actually also get really, really deep. Um, so the kind of bonus goal of doing this is the stellar flaring, but also this is showing now um, the real millimeter visibility data. Uh, so you can see that these are the current data points. This is the model of what the dust belt should look like, and the current observations really just have no power to constrain it. So this is the image again, and this is a simulation of what 40 hours of time would produce in the millimeter image if this belt was actually what it is, 30 AU and two Milojanskis in flux. Um, so the new observations, when combined all together, should basically definitively tell us whether there is a dust belt at 30 AU and what its structure is. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.